we finish up today our series called Fresh Start. We've been looking at uh, these principles that, that God communicates to the children of Israel as they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. It's a whole fresh start, a fresh season for them. And as we've entered into 2017, one of the questions that I asked was simply if there were new, or if, if we knew that there were principles, ideas, concepts that we could apply to our life uh, as we head into kind of this fresh season, then we knew that applying these would help us to have a better year. Would you want to apply them? I think all of us said yes. I didn't promise an easier year. I said better year. Just like the children of Israel are not going to have an easier year. It's going to be far harder as they enter into the promised land, but it will be a better year. And, and so we're looking at these principles, things that God repeats to the, to the children of Israel over and over and over again. So we've talked about obedience. We've talked about uh, giants in the land that you will face trials. That's part of actually the journey of becoming more complete in Christ. And then we've also talked about last week, remembering the power of remembering instruction and remembering uh, uh, testimonies where God has worked in your path to remind you of uh, where he'll be faithful again in the future. Um, this week, we're going to hop in and we're going to dive a little bit further. But before we do so, I want to tell you what's coming next week, okay? Next week, we launch into a new series. Um, and it's not just that we're doing this independently. We're actually doing this with the Refresh Movement or Network right here in Walworth County. So about 17 churches right here in the county. We do uh, things typically or periodically together throughout the year. So serving together, service projects, ministries, and then... Uh, once a year, we'll, we'll teach actually together a very a same topic. And so we're diving into the book of Jonah. So 17 churches, or most of them, will be diving into the book of Jonah next uh, week. So it's really exciting. Throughout, throughout the month of February, we're all going to be reading and studying Jonah. It's going to be a lot of fun. I love sitting down with these pastors. We get to sit down together as we head into the series. We study together. Um, we steal each other's stories and things like that. So it's, it's fun. It's just a good time. So that we launch into that next week. It's going to be a, a great time. But today, uh, we'll close up this series call, uh, called Fresh Start. But let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever felt alone? How many of you have ever felt alone? Every hand should be in the air. Uh, because all of us at some point in our life have felt alone. We just have. I remember there was a time in my life when um, <laughs> my wife and I, we were on vacation, and we had actually six of our kids. That's how many we had at the time. And um, we were down in Illinois, and we had gotten word that one of our former, uh, a group of our s former students who were all siblings, one of their siblings had passed away. And so we thought to ourselves, man, I would love to make it to this, this wake, this funeral. If we could make it there, it's like it was the next day. And so we thought, well, maybe we, on our way home, we were driving home up actually toward Minnesota, and we thought if we could swing by, we could spend a few hours with the family and then um, head on further, further north. And um, so we're trying to go to the visitation we're calling. When we'd been in the area, done about a decade of ministry down in the area in the region where we were, and we're calling family, and we're calling friends, and everywhere we went, we got, no, 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 sorry, can't take your kids. Because I just thought, you know, taking six little ones, six babies into a, a funeral, not the wisest call, you know? I, I just, that was my gut reaction. <laughs> and so I was like, I want to be able to be with the family and care for them and things like that. I don't want to be worrying about my little ones. And so we're calling and we just got kind of door closed after door closed after door closed. And I thought to myself, I finally felt, I just felt like I'm so alone. And yet my wife, we're together in my family, but I felt like no one else is in our corner right now. And finally we got through to one of our former students who was at that point was finally grown and she had her own kids and she was willing to take our kids for a few hours while we went to the visitation funeral. And it was a really sweet moment that we had together. But I remember when we got back in the car feeling like I invested a decade of my life here and there's no one. I felt so alone. And I know all of us will have these moments where it's just like the enemy creeps in and says, you're alone and you've got to handle this thing by yourself. And what do you need to do in those moments? And that's what we're going to try to figure out today. What do we do when we feel like we're alone? Because facing that moment and not knowing where or how you're going to find strength and courage. How am I going to get strength and courage uh, to make it through this moment uh, is critical. Because actually, that's the phrase that we're actually looking at is strength and courage. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, three times he repeats, be strong and courageous. Then in Joshua chapter 1, he repeats again, be strong and courageous, but he connects it with this idea of not being alone. So for this new journey that we're going to be going into, this, this 
year and for literally for the, uh, the Israelites as they were entering into the promised land, God gives them this instruction, be strong and courageous. Over and over and over again, he says it. So they're going to need strength. What's that? Well, that's simply, they're going to need to access the strength that is necessary, the energy or the power to make it through it. And then he says, I want you to be courageous. That's the bravery or the guts or the confidence now to go through it. So it's those two elements. One is the strength and the power to go through it. The other is the bravery or the guts and the confidence to go through it. But here's the question I have for you. Where in the world does strength and courage come from? It's the churchy answer, okay? Oh, God. Oh, yes, God. There's, usually you're safe with like, I, I call them the churchy answers. It's, it's usually the Bible, God, or Jesus. You're safe with one of those three normally. And in this case, yes, that is the answer. It's, it's God. And while that seems obvious, okay, we get strength and courage from God when we feel alone. The, the, the real question is, how do we actually access or tap into this strength and courage from God? So let's look at those six verses where, where God says, be strong and courageous, and see if he gives us some insight into how we get the strength and courage from him. Okay, so let's check it out. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. This is what it says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, meaning their enemies or the, the giants who are in the land who they're going to be facing. For the Lord your God goes with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. Verse 8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Hop down a few verses of verse 23. The Lord gave this command to Joshua, son of Nun, be strong and courageous, for you will bring the Israelites into the land I promised them on oath, and I myself will be with you. Okay, Joshua chapter 1, he mentions this idea, be strong and courageous three times there. Let's check it out. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Oh, God upped his game. Very. Be careful to obey all the law my, Mos my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn to it to, to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Yeah, I think we figured it out. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So six times he repeats to them, be strong and courageous. Okay, so they're supposed to have this strength. They're supposed to be, have this courage. Where are they going to get it from? Well, I've underlined it many times for you, so it should be obvious. They're going to get it from, and yes, it's the churchy answer. They're going to get it from, from God. They're going to get it from him. It's really hard to miss it. But more specifically, it will come from his presence. It's not just going to come from him. It's going to come from presence. I'm with them, is what he says, that they're going to be with him. See, there's, there's something about presence that provides courage. His presence, knowing that he is with you, provides you with strength and courage. You know, picture it like this. It's always easy to face, or easier to face your fears when you've got someone alongside, beside you during that moment, Right? Like, imagine I've shown you pictures of people going through haunted houses in the past. You never see anyone going alone. I don't know if there's any of you who have ever done that before. That You're crazy, okay? I mean, when I was in high school, I don't do the same more, but when I was in high school, I used to go through haunted houses, and so I'd always go through it. I always went through with someone else. One is to hold on to them. Second, I was usually bigger, so to throw them at whatever I was afraid of. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's just our deal. We, we don't go alone. You don't want to go it alone. You don't want to face fear alone. You want someone else with you. Even my, uh, my young son right now, he'll come downstairs at night when we lay him down, and uh, he'll come downstairs and we'll say, go back to bed, and he says, I'm afraid. Okay, let's pray for you. And then he always just asks his questions. When's my older brother coming to bed? See, they have different bedtimes, and the older one goes down about a half hour, 45 minutes later, and he's ju he just wants someone else in the room. He doesn't want to be alone. We, we can all relate to that, this idea of, listen, if I'm going to face my fears, I just don't want to do it alone. In fact, Jesus even modeled this same idea to his disciples, that 
listen, when you, to find courage, you're going to find courage in his presence. Let me set the scene for you, uh, and then I'm going to read a verse to you, okay? The scene is this. The disciples have had a really long day, okay? A long day ministering with Jesus. They've seen him perform some amazing miracles. He multiplied all these breads, then, bread. Then he sent them in boats, and he said, go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they're rowing across the Sea of Galilee to try to make it to the other side. It gets to three in the morning. The reason why they haven't made it to the other side is that the winds and the waves have, have stirred up, and now they're kind of caught in a storm out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they've been rowing for six hours. Okay, so now if you're already exhausted, a little delirious perhaps, you, you think, are we going to die out here on the Sea of Galilee? All these waves, we haven't made any headway, we're still stuck. Then it's three in the morning and you're like, you feel so exhausted and they think they see something or someone walking on the water. You think that's going to freak you out in the moonlight? Walking on water? Yeah. And so what they are seeing is they're seeing Jesus actually walking out on the water towards them and they're freaked out. So this is what he says, Mark chapter 6, verse 50. Because they, being the disciples, all saw him. They were terrified. They're terrified because they don't know who it is from a distance. So what does he say? He immediately spoke to them and said, take courage. Remember, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. The same idea, Jesus says it to them. Take courage. Then he says, it is I don't be afraid. Isn't it interesting that once again, he says, guys, I want you to have courage, and then he connects it immediately with his presence. It's me. Now, you could take that in, in kind of, I, I take it in two ways. It's the obvious way, which would be, guys, guys, don't freak out, it's me. Which we go, okay, yeah, that seems to make sense that it's Jesus saying, don't freak out, it's me. But then maybe I'm digging a little deeper here, but is it also him perhaps saying, guys, take courage, because I'm now with you. It's me, and I'm here. My presence is with you, and I'm going to do what I've always done. And when his feet step in the boat, the seas go calm, and they reach the other side. Is it possible that he's even teaching them presence? When my presence is here, I offer something that when I say take courage, you can actually have it because my presence is here. Here's another place in Scripture where Jesus reminds his disciples that they're going to face fears in life, but he reminds them of how important his presence is, okay? In John chapter 14, verse 27, this is what he says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Okay, so he's just told them, guys, I'm going to give you a, a type of peace, a peace that the world does not offer, okay? Something unique, something special, something that will enable you not to be afraid. You're going to have courage. Okay, now I'm going a little bit out of order. I'm showing you verse 27. So where in the world are they going to get this peace, this peace that kind of surpasses understanding, this peace that the world doesn't offer? Where is that going to come from? It's actually going to come from presence. Go back one verse to verse 26. This is what he says. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So he's saying, guys, guess what? I'm going to give you peace, but you want to know where you're going to find it? You're going to find it from my Holy Spirit who will be in you. He will be with you. Here's how he describes it earlier in the chapter in verse 16. He says this. I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you and will be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. You've got the Spirit of God who will be with you so that, quite frankly, you're not going to have to be terrified or have fear. Instead, he's going to offer you peace, peace that the world does not offer for every situation that you face. So when the disciples here, they're concerned about what life is going to look like after Jesus, because he's actually been talking about leaving them, and they're freaking out. So he tells them all these things that, listen, if I go, it's actually better because I'm going to send the Spirit who will be in you and will be with you. And he affirms to them that, that those who follow him are actually getting something better. More specifically, they're getting the Spirit who will live in them, to empower them, to give them strength and courage, and that he'll always be with them. So here's the deal. For us, folks, if you're a follower of Christ, 
The same is true for you. His spirit is in you and he's with us. So then here's my question. If his spirit is in those of us who call ourselves Christ followers, why do we still struggle with courage and strength? Why is it that we, do we still struggle to be strong and courageous if his presence is with us and in us in the form of his spirit. And I would argue it's because you've got the, this with us idea a little bit messed up, okay? I just want to ask the question and l- take us to some scripture to kind of process, do we have this with us idea just a little bit messed up? So we're going to go to Joshua chapter 5, okay? So once again, the, disi- or the Israelites have entered into the promised land. They crossed the Jordan River. Last week we talked about that. Now they are on the edge of entering into, I mean, they're just like about to face the first city, Jericho, okay? And Joshua is standing there. It's almost like he's overlooking Jericho and he has this mini conversation with someone. So let's check it out. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? So Joshua thinks that at this time, he thinks that this is just a man with a sword. And so he asks him the question, hey, are you with us or are you with them? Right? Who are you with? Right? This is what he's asking. And he's quickly going to find out that the guy's not with him or them. Verse 14, he says, neither but as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. See, Joshua's talking with an angel, the, the commander of the army of the Lord. And then at this, Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? See, what Joshua did is he approached the situation and said, here's where I'm going. Are you with us or are you with them? And he goes, neither. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with God. The question is, are you going to be with us? And when Joshua says, command this servant what the Lord wants me to do, when he says that by calling himself the Lord's servant, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm on board to serve God, to serve you. I want to be with you. I, I've got, I'm going to bring out something for you, okay? Just a little illustration. Help us kind of get this, okay? Give me a, a moment, okay, to bring out some, some items, okay? A couple... Okay, here's one. And here's my, my other buddy. I had some wardrobe malfunctions with him earlier. But we got them all squared away. Okay. So, for the sake of uh, this illustration, let me just uh, designate who these people will represent, my headless mannequins, okay? Uh, this is going to represent God in his white shirt, so he's uh, holy and pure. And then this guy over here in the Lakeland small groups shirt, he's going to represent us, humanity, okay? And, and, or just those in humanity in general. But I can almost imagine that this is what the conversation looked like between Joshua and the angel of the Lord. It's he gets on up and he starts looking over the valley and he's looking at Jericho and he says, I've got a plan. I think we can take Jericho if we go this way. Kind of, we're going to go head on. We'll send a couple guys around the side. And he sees this guy and says, hey, are you with us? Are you with us or are you with them? Are you going to come and are you going to follow me to Jericho? And, and it's like the angel of the Lord says, <laughs> you've got this thing all wrong. I'm not with you or with them. I see Jericho, but I'm with the Lord. And this is my plan and this is how we're going to take it. Now, the real question is, are you going to follow me? What we so often do is I'm, I'm afraid that we do the same type of dance with God often where we say, God, I've got a plan for life. Here's where I want to go. Here's what I want to do. Here's the relationship that I think is important that I invest in. Here's the business proposition that I want to make. And here's where I want to go. Hey, God, would you come with me? Would you just be with me? Now, now get this, folks, because this is important. In both positions, God is with you. This is why I think we get this idea of God being with us a little messed up, is that if we go this way and we ask God to follow because he is omnipresent, meaning he is all places at all times, he will be with you. 
And what we've sometimes done is we've said, God, would you be with us as we go here? But we wonder why we don't have strength and courage, and we don't have strength and courage because we've got the order all, all wrong. See, in Deuteronomy 31, in uh, this whole mesh where he says, or this whole mix of where he's saying, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, for I'm going to be with you, he actually points out the order. Check it out. Deuteronomy 31, he says, the Lord your God himself goes what? He goes before you. See, the whole intention is that he is going to lead the way. He will go before you and that we do this. We fall in line and we are with him and he is with us, but this is the correct order. And in this order, guess what you will find? You're going to find strength and courage and you want to know where you're going to get it from? You're going to get it from him. The reason why you don't have strength and courage when God is with you and you're doing your own thing is because you're leading your own way and he won't provide you with his strength and courage when you're going this direction, away from him. But he will when you're going this direction. For some of you here, <laughs> I wonder, have you been thinking God would be with you in whatever your endeavors were in life, whatever your plans were in life. God, here's my great plans. Please come with me. How many of your prayers sound like that? I, uh, this past week, or last week, I was uh, meeting with a group of pastors, and one pastor was telling us um, how he was trying to rally his church around a cause. It was a good, it's a good cause. It's a biblical cause, actually. And another pastor asked the question, he asked, this is a great cause, but at what point kind of in the cause will people be rallied or, or understand who Christ is? Where is Christ in the, the strategy of how people will discover what this is all about? Because the cause is good, but if Christ is not introduced into it, it, it will lack at some point. And he said, well, we don't really need to do that. We're just going to be about the cause because they know that we're a church. To which I said, I get that you're a church, and there's lots of great Christian organizations and lots of Christians out there, quite frankly, who are doing, though, that same thing. They're saying, here's what I'm about. God, would you come with me? And they treat God, they treat Jesus more like their mascot versus their Lord. This is, this is the position of Jesus as your mascot. This is where I'm going. Jesus, would you follow? Would you be with me? And you're kind of doing... <laughs> princess wave. There's Jesus behind me. We're waving the Jesus flag. Isn't it nice that he's with us? But he's just our mascot. Where Jesus says your Lord is really quite different. You're not leading him. He's leading you. You're surrendered fully to him in all things. I, I wonder if there are some people here in this room who, if you were honest, you would say, you know, Jesus for me has probably only ever really been kind of a mascot. I've been le leading my life, living my life, my entire life on my own. Like, have I heard about Jesus? Yeah. Do I know a little bit about what he did and died on the cross for my sins? I've heard all that. And it's really cool. He kind of comes along with me for the ride in life. But if you were honest, you would say, I've never made him my Lord. That's different. See, Lord means something. That's a loaded term. It means that he is leading. He's calling the shots. He's directing your life, not, not the other way around. You might say, how, how do I make him my Lord? Well, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 gives us some insight into that. It says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now, now if you can think that you can just outsmart God by saying the right thing, saying the right prayer, you're wrong. <laughs> because he, he then tags on, and if you believe in your heart. It's, it's the head and the heart combined together. It's, we can't just give God lip service and say, oh yeah, I believe you, that's good. Now, he knows what's really taking place. Do you really believe him? Do you really want to make him your Lord? Do you really want to trust him as your Lord and Savior? If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. And I imagine that there's some of you here in the room who perhaps uh, you genuinely have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But almost from day one, <laughs> you've been doing this. God, would you come along with me? Would you follow me? Lord, would you be with me? And you pray lots of God be with me prayers. And you're just begging him to come along with your plans. And perhaps right now, even in this moment, it will be a moment of repentance saying, I think I had things all wrong. I shouldn't have said, God, are you with me? Are you with my enemy? I should have said, God, you have a plan. How can I join you in it? So we're just going to bow our heads right now. And, uh, 
do a little bit of business with God. For some of you here, if God's been your mascot and not your Lord, and perhaps you want to make him your Lord today, it can be a very simple prayer like this, but you, it's between you and God, and he knows what's really taking place in your heart, but it can sound something like this. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner and that my sins have offended a holy God, but you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins. You made a way at the cross for me to have a restored relationship with you. And I've thought Jesus was a really cool figure, but I, if I'm honest, I've just made him a mascot in my life, never my Lord. And so today I make him my Lord, my Savior. I ask that your spirit would fill me, knowing that you will forever be with me. So that I have nothing to fear. As we continue praying, there's some of you here who, you've already trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've been leading the way. Maybe just in an area, maybe just in a decision. And you've been begging, God, would you come with me? And you just need to right now put God in his rightful place and say, all right, God, would you lead me into this place, on this journey, and I'll follow you. So, Heavenly Father, I repent of my pride, of my desire to do things my own way, to lead my own life, and to make my own decisions. And I instead, I follow you. And in this position of following you, I know that you'll be with me, but in this presence, that I live in your presence, you'll also provide strength and courage. Strength and courage that's fresh. It's peace that the world does not offer and does not give. And so, Lord, I'm so thankful for it. Lord, help us to always keep this position, this order correct, where you're leading us, not the other way around. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.